We'll the call the meeting the of the Post Water Infrastructure Citizens Advisory Committee okay. to order. Uh, and uh, we'll do a roll call. Uh, everyone's here except for Dan Warren. Um, uh, in that case, then, let's uh, turn it over to James Retrano. He's going to be facilitating the meeting for us, and I'm going to be saying a little talk. All right. Thank you, uh, Jim. And you're going to say a whole lot at the near the end of today's session. But I appreciate the opportunity to to be with you this evening and to help facilitate um, this process. As mentioned, and you, I'm sure everyone here has reviewed some of the preliminary documentation. Um, so I, I won't belabor a lot of that. But this meeting is a little bit to get to know each other. Um, this is still a very formal setting, obviously. Um, as indicated by the mics in front of you, um, we are on. Um, we are being broadcast, and all of our meetings will be both public and broadcast. Um, we will have an opportunity for public discussion both at the beginning of each meeting and at the end. Um, we will have formal agendas for each of our meetings. One of the goals towards the end of this meeting will be to hear from my city manager of the current status um, and the other primary goal this evening which we'll handle before that is to all be on the same page of our objectives um, we will be prepared for each meeting and in each meeting we hope to make progress towards a late April um, date to deliver a recommendation back to the Commission so with that very brief introduction I'd like to open it up for public comment. If there's anyone from the public that would like to address, um, as as agreed to with the city commission, we will use the same rules as city commission has for its public comment. Um, there is no specific timeline. I'll attempt to uh, mitigate if there's any issues with public comment, but we want to be inclusive as possible throughout this entire process and intend to be. So I will pause. See if anyone would like to approach the microphone that's set up next to Belinda. Please announce your name. Sure. Uh, Brett Scott, 6 Devonshire. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for participating in the CAC. It's a, a pleasure to see all of you here, and I am very much appreciative of your knowledge and your time. Looking forward to see what recommendations that you uh, make uh, for the city. And uh, I'm not planning to attend most of the meetings. I think I've mentioned that to most of you or all of you. Uh, if you need me here, let me know. I'm going to keep your calendar free on my calendar so that I'm available to you if there are questions that you have on a historical basis about uh, what we have done in the city in the past, and, uh, or if you just uh, would like to hear what I think. Uh, but uh, again, thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Our next item on the agenda is introduction of CAC members. Um, for this part, you know, we, you all have certain backgrounds that you brought to the table this evening. You all also have certain experiences um, and reasons for volunteering for this um, this recommendation, this recommendation committee, or this advisory committee. Um, what we'd like to do is go around the table. And I don't want to cut you too short, you know, but if, if it's a few minutes, I'm most interested in names, just so we can get to know each other beyond the name tag. Maybe your, your reason for wanting to put in an application for this um, committee, as well as just a little bit of your background, professional background and professional interest in, the, um, in this matter. The last thing I, I'd like you to think about, though, you don't have to articulate during your um, introduction unless you don't want to be considered. Um, I'll share one piece of information. Next meeting, we will be selecting among the body a chair, a vice chair, and probably a secretary. And there's not a lot of work that goes into any of those positions, other than if we need to bounce something off of the chair, someone that can speak and bring the meeting to order that isn't me, but rather part of the body, which is appropriate. The vice chair literally will do nothing as long as the chair attends the meeting. So that's the best position. I always wanted to be vice chair. 
Um, and the secretary, there will be no minute obligations or minute taking or note taking obligation from the secretary. But what I would ask is that we have a, a member of the body that will be able to review notes that either I take or um, Jim takes. We will take charge, but I do want a member of the body to be able to, to see them in advance before we get them to the committee. Um, so with those job descriptions, if you particularly do not want to be considered at the next meeting for those job descriptions, you can share that also in your introduction. Um, I, don't, I don't want to um, not to allow someone to, to raise that. But let's take a moment and I'll pause to repeat what I'm asking. Nay, reason that you want to be here and a little professional background for yourself. So I'll give like 10 seconds and then we'll start on one end or the other. I won't reveal that just yet. <laughs> Yeah, that's the strategic replaced. Yeah. All right, Belinda, you're up first. Good evening. I'm Belinda Peters. Um, I am a 35-year retired public servant, and so I feel like I have a lot of expertise to bring to the table. I was uh, retired as a Livingston County administrator, and I worked for the city of Rochester Hills and I specifically worked in the water and sewer department for many years. So I believe that I just, I have a lot of experience to bring to the table. Um, and I like to think, keep things short and sweet, so that's really, that's it. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, Mark De La Verne. Uh, I'm at 29 Maplefield, been there almost five years now. Um, and the reason I joined, you know, I think this was a, you know, it's a tough, tough issue. Um, I like solving problems. Uh, thought I could bring, you know, some insight, ability to kind of get, get to, to compromise. Um, I, uh, my background's in transportation, worked in transportation, um, moved here to Detroit to, to work in the mayor's office. Um, so I, commiserate with, with Jim somewhat on sort of uh, the, the challenges of, of solving a lot of, lot of challenges. Um, so, you know, just looking forward to, to working with you all. And I'm Kate Kokotovich, and my reasons for um, wanting to participate in this uh, committee is because I care a lot about the city of Pleasant Ridge, and um, I know that there are a lot of people who donate a lot of time and contribute to various committees, and I thought it was, I was due to raise my hand for that. Uh, we've been here about 10 years, and my background is I'm, a, I'm an attorney, transactional attorney, so I've got a lot of experience, almost 20 years, of helping people get deals across the finish line, and so I'm hoping that those skills will help me to hear what people are saying, what their concerns are, and help folks kind of come together to find a, a solution that's going to work for everybody. That's all. Um, John McKenna, I live at 15 Millington. Um, We've been living here in Pleasant Ridge about five years. And the main reason why I, I volunteered for this uh, committee is I simply want to give back to the community. Um, you know, with my work life the last many years, I haven't been able to do something like this. And with COVID and working on the house, I have been. Um, I would have about 30 years experience in uh, consulting. I currently work for a, a large multinational uh, environmental design engineering firm headquartered at Amsterdam. And uh, I, work, I work on some of our, I lead some of our global accounts, so I have a lot of expertise in looking at projects such as this and bringing clients, bringing public, bringing regulators together to come up with a, a common path forward. Okay. I'm Tom Kempa. Uh, live at uh, 105 Cambridge Boulevard. Um, currently, I'm working at a logistics company, um, a CPA. I work in the accounting and finance department. Uh, previous to the, to that. I worked at a CPA firm serving municipalities across Metro Detroit, so well-versed in kind of uh, water and sewer funds, municipal finance, and other things. So I thought I could, you know, give back uh, and serve on this committee uh, with uh, the background that I have. My name is Jay Foreman. I live at 60 Oakdale. Um, we've lived in town 10-ish years. Um, some background that I have on this issue, I've, I've got some awareness of what's been going on with water infrastructure changes and water billing changes over the past decade or so. I had a stint on the city commission for a term and we worked a lot with that and passed the millage to make some changes to that. So I have some history in that and uh, some vested interest in that and um, also an eye toward fairness. If I, if I can see a, a solution that's going to be most fair for the maximum number of people, that's what I'm going to want to go for. 
I'm not tied to any particular solution one way or the other. Um, I just want to find what's best for the maximum number of people. Um, my professional life, I do IT type stuff, so um, problem solving is a big part of my job and uh, looking at what makes the most sense, not necessarily what's going to make everybody happy. That's, that's where I'm going to go for it. Look forward to working with you all. Thanks. Uh, Tom Wilkinson, we've been at uh, 130 Maple Field for 34 years now. Um, I, um, we've been, I've been following this issue along. I've been on the, uh, the Planning Commission, the DDA, and, and currently the chair. So we've been sort of tracking along with the issue. So as it's evolved and looking at all of the challenges from the, both the service line and the water main side. Uh, professional background, I recently retired from GM uh, with corporate communications, product and technology primarily, and a lot of what that involves is working with um, cross-functional teams of people with various expertise to try to try to come together and, and find the best solutions and, and make sure we're getting you know the best expertise um, into the decisions so that we can reach the best solutions. Right? Again, I want to try to find the fairest solution that, that meets the needs of the most people, even though probably not everybody will be 100% happy with it. So. I'm Robert Morris. I um, bought my house here nine years ago and moved in three years ago. But that's a whole other story. Uh, I'm an IT consultant and I've been doing that for uh, a number of decades. I work with all size clients from single entity, people up to fortune, five companies. I do project management. And I believe that I should be able to help come up with a good uh, compromise for the city as a whole. That's why I'm here. Hi, I'm Eric Wagner. Um, I've lived in Pleasant Ridge for about five years now. Uh, like John and Kate, I want to give back to the community. I think everyone in the community is very involved, so I think it's about time that I get involved as well. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've been a system administrator for the Workday HR system. And so part of my job is problem solving, coming to consensus with groups, that sort of thing, and configuring the system. So I think um, some of those problem solving abilities might come into play here. So that's why I'm here. My name is Pat Young. I live at uh, 19 Wellesley, and I've been here for 42 years. Um, have not done a whole lot of volunteering for the city before, but felt that this was a good opportunity since uh, there have been a lot of ideas and, and questions uh, put out that, uh, and certainly with the impressive background of uh, my fellow committee members, uh, it sounds like uh, we'll be able to bring up some good information and, and hopefully find a solution that will, again, work out the best for most of the people in the city. It's, uh, it's one of those problems that may not have the best solution for everybody. But the best we can. And I'm a retired registered nurse. Uh, my name is Damian Jerkus. I'm from 39 Devonshire. I've got 27 years at Chrysler as a tradesman. So I've actually done some of this work, but not into the uh, uh, public sector. Um, I also am an attorney. And I went to school later in life. And I've been an advocate the whole time I've done it. That's the reason I went. Um, and my goal with this community is to make sure that we, we examine every different version out there to make sure that it's the best version possible. So that it's fair, and I know some people are not going to get, you know, some people are not going to be happy. It's, it's just like a law, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll give a very good brief intro for myself, uh, for the committee members, and of course the public. Um, my name is James Petrano, and, and I'm going to help facilitate this. With the professionalism that we have on this board, um, you know, I think I will facilitate less as we start to get into this. My my goal is to allow you to to ask questions, to gather information, and then make sure whatever additional you need post meeting, between meeting, is done in a way that makes you effective when we come together. Um, my background is city management. 17 years as a city manager. Uh, both in Pennsylvania and Michigan, uh, most recently in Rochester until 2015 when I went and um, became a full-time faculty member at a university as well as starting um, consulting for, for communities. Uh, my main focus is here in Oakland County with uh, Pleasant Ridge and a number of your neighbors as clients on recruiting as well as facilitation. 
So again, my goal today, I will probably speak a little bit more than I will in any future meeting. Um, once we've established the chair, um, I think that'll, that'll pass the time a little bit, but, but again, view me as a resource between meetings, during meetings, if I think there's a log jam or there's, there's something I might be able to offer to get us through, um, I will do so. One thing I do want to, to share with you, and for those of you that have had an opportunity to, to access the Google Drive that has been set up for this project and for the public view of access to it as well, the tool that the city managers put together for us in order to explore options, which we'll review towards the end of this meeting, really is, is quite a powerful tool, and that's where we're going to start. But feel free, if you think there's pieces of information or, or knowledge that you want to, to be researched, um, that is, that's my goal, to facilitate that in between stuff uh, to make you effective. Um, Jim, I don't know if you want to say anything. Please hide. Yeah. Um, I should recommend the city manager. You, you've probably seen me speak on this at some point um, over the last year or so. Uh, at, at this point, um, we this is a very impressive body. We're, I'm never um, not amazed by the, the, the wealth of um, knowledge and experience that we have in this community of 2,500 people. And uh, I'm looking forward to being a resource to you uh, through this process. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end of this meeting about some of the background information, but uh, we're here, I'm here, James is here, to bring you whatever other information you want, whatever you need to see, we'll, we'll go get it for you. There's other people who you need to come talk to you as a group. We'll get them here. Um, city attorney, uh, city engineer, other professionals. Uh, we will make that available to you. So uh, let me know what you need. Write it, and I'm looking uh, forward to, to hearing the deliberations and seeing where this goes. Thank you. Um, anyone have any comments before we jump to our next agenda item, which is review of our objectives? Great. So you have in the packet that was distributed the objectives memo that was approved by the city commission. Um, to me, this is really important that the commission give us clear direction give us a clear goal and clear guide rails. Um, as an advisory committee, your role should be clearly defined as we start. Um, our roles are defined by the points that are in the memo. I won't read it verbatim. I trust that all the professionals around the table have, have reviewed it. But for the public, I do want to stress a couple of points throughout. And again, I, I say this just as a reminder, not as a belief that you haven't reviewed it. Um, but from that first objective, the most important one, our goal is to address what is the most appropriate funding option for the city to fund an already agreed upon water infrastructure capital project. So our goal is to figure out the mix of dollars that will fund an already agreed upon project. And if we, um, as we're doing that work, we want to consider city funds that are under the full control of the city as step one. And step two, so a couple meetings out, we can have a discussion about grants and external funding, but that'll be applied as part of our discussion after we decide on the right mix of city funds to fulfill the goals of the capital projects uh, for water infrastructure. Um, we need to work with our city staff, as Jim just mentioned, whether it's the attorney, the engineer, Jim, um, whatever information we need, we'll get from the city, and we need to consider that information from the city ballot. If for any reason you think there's some additional information you need to validate it, or anything additional you need to further your understanding of it, please communicate that to either Jim and I, either during a public session, or shoot us an email. Um, we want to consider the information that the city provides as the information that we are all working from the same, the same baseline of, of data. The goal, and I stress goal, of this uh, body is to offer a single recommendation to the commission, the city commission. So that is a single recommendation. That doesn't mean one funding source. That means it can be multiple funding sources, but some mix that the 12 of you come to consensus on. Whether that can be achieved or not, we will, we will proceed throughout the process with that being the goal. If at some point we need one of the off-ramps that we can't come to full consensus, we have tools to say, 
We come to a majority agreement with these concerns from the minority. We come to a split recommendation, and then you throw it back to the commission. But we're not going to, our goal, our higher level goal to keep in mind is um, consensus. Your obligation will be to present the recommendation to the commission um, late March, early April. I think I got that wrong earlier. So I read my, from my notes. Late March, early April, a recommendation or no recommendation from this commission. Then it's it's in the commission's hands. Your duty is done in, as far as this set of um, requests. Of course, we will be civil in, the, in here um, with each other. We will be civil with public comment, um, and I will help facilitate that as best I can. Um, but I don't expect we'll have that as any issue. Everything we do will be open in the public. We will have no conversations amongst ourselves outside of this, particularly if there's a majority of you around. If there's two of you talking about what just happened in the meeting as you're walking out the door, that's fine. That's two people that are engaged in a process that are still engaged in it as they're walking out of the room. But we will not meet as a group outside of the public, and certainly a majority of you should not meet together in any circumstance. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody's got a big house party planned between <laughs> now and March, where half of you will be, but don't come let's here. avoid that. Um, we, we want to be fully transparent with what we're doing. Um, and finally, I appreciate, you know, us, and this isn't in the memo, but um, respecting each other with regard to COVID and mask wearing and distancing. If anybody at any time feels um, that they wish something else to be in place, um, for their protection, the protection of others, please approach us offline and we would be happy to accommodate that. Um, and and that's, that's the objective memo as approved by the commission in summary. Any questions for me or Jim on, on that objective um, list? So our next antenna item, which, which rolls right from the prior, is discussion of CAC meeting goals and, and policy deliberation. Um, and I think I covered most of it with my experience comments on the, um, on the objectives. But our goal in policy deliberation is to come to a recommendation, um, not to come to a final decision for our community. Um, I'll take this moment to ask you to consider um, the opportunity to be at the chair of this committee. Um, I, what will likely happen at the next meeting, I will ask is anybody willing to nominate someone or nominate themselves to be chair? What will likely happen is we will have 45 seconds of awkward silence, <laughs> and then someone will tentatively raise their hand, and then that person will probably be chair, and then we'll do the same exercise for vice chair and secretary, that's okay. But I also want you to proactively think about your, your um, experience and how you may help move us along as chair, as vice chair, or as secretary. And proactively um, take, take an opportunity at our next meeting to um, state your desire. Um, or nominate somebody by surprise. Um, <laughs> Our goal, again, is to have that chair who can open our meeting, keep things in order while I can help facilitate. The vice chair is in the, in the absence of the chair, does the same, and the secretary is going to just review notes before we put it up to the group. Any questions about objectives, goals, deliberation? Oh, I got a question. Yeah, quick question. Um, will one of those persons who take on one of those three roles uh, be responsible for delivering any kind of report at city commission meetings? Because I was thinking that might be a good idea. Yes. So the final, and it doesn't have to be the chair, but likely people will turn to that chair person. Um, you can nominate amongst yourselves as you get to know each other a little bit more. As you, pre as you prepare for late March, early April, this body will attend. I'm assuming all members will want to attend a commission meeting to present the recommendation and be there for any subsequent questions, but there will be a member or two that probably takes the lead. 
Um, it will default to the chair unless around the table everybody says, you know, you did a great job being chair, but John, you're the one we want to present. Um, so it's not an obligation that's tied with the position, but it's probably a default position to have in mind. Hopefully that was a clear answer. Yep. Okay, if you um, have an opportunity to make sure that the green dot is on your microphone, and then if you can lean into that microphone and enunciate through your mask, <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Um, all right, so the next opportunity we have is uh, the city manager is going to give us a brief presentation. This is a presentation that he's updated from prior presentations. Um, but we want to, again, make sure we start at the same base knowledge. This has been uh, an early presentation was provided to you in advance. This one, obviously, is, is, will be for your reference. And then this all leads to, I hope Jim will help us with the, the final tool that he's helped, or the tool as it exists now, put together to begin our discussion, um, even at this meeting, but certainly at our next meeting, with understanding the impact of the different funding mechanisms that, that can be had um, in order to accomplish the infrastructure projects. So without any more, Jim? Um, am I OK volume-wise on the mic here? Good. OK. So you uh, had the uh, excerpted presentation from the town hall meeting in October. Um, that was a lot of the background information on the actual project itself. The need for the project are the approach as we are uh, considering it. This is an ever-evolving thing. Uh, when we were doing the presentation in October, the infrastructure bill was a theoretical thing, now it's a real thing. So we are adjusting and uh, looking at some options to access federal infrastructure money. That means that the approach that we presented and we had formulated for October might be a little bit different, but the, the broad strokes are still the same. So uh, I do have that uh, presentation here. I'll run through it very, very quickly. If anyone had any questions or wanted to discuss any of the points in here, please just raise your hand and we'll take that as we go through it. Uh, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. Uh, we do have a lot of these uh, resources available online. Uh, we're doing this on this schedule because the state mandated that we have to replace all lead service lines. While we're doing that, we have 100-year-old water mains. They're end of life. Um, and we are seeing some uh, declines in flow rate, particularly fire flow rates at this time, but uh, that the water mains are not going to improve. The water system, uh, we have three main parts to the water system. You have the distribution supply lines, the water mains. Those go to a service line which feeds water to each house. Uh, there's two parts to the service line, the public side and the private side. The city owns the public side service line uh, up to the stop box, which is usually just on the house side of the sidewalk. And then beyond that, it's a privately owned service line. Uh, the state, when they mandated that we have to replace all the service lines, mandated also that we have to do the entire thing, also the private uh, side of that service line. Uh, preliminary costs, not preliminary, we're, we're, we're getting more experience with this because we've started doing some of these water main replacements or water service line replacements, I should say. Uh, the cost to do a private service line is about $3,500. The cost to replace the public side of the service line is anywhere between seven and $10,000. This is just because the private side line is not under a street, whereas the public service line is under a street. And the variable cost, the seven to 10, is because the water mains on one side of the street and uh, you can have a long run or a short run, depending on which side of the street you're on relative to that water main. So that changes how much street has to be dug up, how much uh, line they have to pull. So our total cost to replace a service line is somewhere between 10 and 13,500 or $14,000. We know that, uh, well, at the time, based on our preliminary inventory, and this was a records inventory, going back and, and looking at the water installation cards uh, from sometimes back in 1924 when the water mains were laid, and we had incomplete information. We don't have those records from 100 years ago for every property, but we had what we thought were 699 known or suspected lead service lines out of our 1,150 total. So we believe that about 60% of our service lines were lead. 
And one thing to consider is that any lead in the service line whatsoever means that that is entirely a lead service line. Um, if the lead is in between the main and the stop box, and then from the stop box to the house is copper, we don't have to replace the copper. But for the purposes of the state, uh, it is a lead service line. So this is a new slide. This is something that we just got this information yesterday. As you know, we're doing our detailed uh, materials inventory. That's the next step that the state is requiring us to do. We have to do a statistically valid uh, number of investigations. We actually go out and dig a hole in the ground to inspect visually the service line. Um, for us, given that our, our small system size, uh, to get that statistically valid sample, we have to do 20% of all water customers in the, in the city. It equals about 225 services that we have to look at. So far, we've done about, we've done 44 last week. On the public side, on Kensington, Devonshire, Wellesley, and Amherst, uh, the public side leads were 42 lead leads and two copper leads. So right now, we're at about 95% lead service lines. Question. Yes. So when you see the private side, uh, we had inf more information about the private side because when we did the water main, or I'm sorry, the water meter replacement project, one of the things we did was inspect the service line inside the house. The state's detailed uh, inventory requirements require a three-point inspection inside the house and then on either side of the stop box. So we kind of expected, based on what we saw from inside the houses, that we'd have somewhere between 45 and 60 percent copper or I'm sorry, lead, between 45 and 60% lead on the private side. The public side, so you'll you actually see that played out. On the private side sample, it was 22 uh, copper, one plastic, and 21 lead service lines on the private side. So clearly people have replaced their own private side service lines um, at some point you know, over the last 100 years. So yeah, this is kind of what we, what we expected when, when, when homeowners come in to replace their service line, they typically only go to the stop box because that's where it starts getting really expensive. So we kind of suspected but didn't know what our public side leads would look like. Um, and this is kind of confirming what we expected. So the good news, the good news is that this really won't increase our project cost. You might think we are expecting 60%, we have 90%. But it doesn't really matter because when you replace a water main, you replace all of the public side leads anyways. So 100% public service lead replacement was already built into the cost estimates. You, you lay down a new uh, public side line and you put in a new stop box. Part of it too is that we're trying to move the water mains out from underneath the street as much as we can. So we have to replace all the public side leads because we're moving the physical location of the, of the water main in many cases. So this really doesn't impact our estimated project cost, but what it does do is as we apply to the state now for uh, drinking water revolving loan funds, it may give us a better case to make. And we can say, well, you know, 90% of our service lines are lead. That's a lot more and a lot bigger of a problem than 60%. So, you know, it, it does help to help us build our case around why the state should give us funding because the state ultimately are the ones who are receiving the federal infrastructure bill money. It's going into the state drinking water revolving loan fund. So the state's making those funding decisions. So we have to convince them that our project is worthy and that we should be funded um, as we compete with every other community across the state for this money. So this is an outdated graphic. We would probably look more like Ferndale. Um, so, all right. Um, this is an important one. Some of the questions we get are, well, why, why can't we just replace the service lines and leave the water mains in place to save money? And it's mainly because you're breaking into the street regardless. Um, we're probably breaking into the street a little bit less when you replace the water main and move it outside of the street because then you'd be in the, uh, you'd be digging more, you'd be digging more in the, in the tree lawn area between the sidewalk and the street to access the water main you probably be, will be doing directional drilling um, to place that main there, so it won't be an open cut trench. So replacing the water main actually um, should disrupt the street less than if we just went and replaced all the service lines. And as we see, when you have to replace 90% of the service lines, the street would be very torn up to leave the existing water mains in place. 
Jim, in that example, the water main will be relocated from where the street's been broken up into the, uh, whatever we're calling that area, grassy area next to the street. And then we go under the driveway, deeper, and so on, continue forward. Correct. So right now the water main is somewhere around here, and then the sewer is on the other side of the street behind you. So the water main would be relocated in this area here. So pros are in the future, whenever you have to access that water main for any reason, you're not breaking up your street. Cons, we're going to lose some trees uh, yeah. through this process. Yeah. I'll commit right now that we'll replace every tree we cut down as part of a water main project. But unfortunately, that is going to be an impact. But um, when you do directional drilling, it may impact some of the aprons. We'll replace those. But by and large, they should be able to do their potholing and drilling uh, in the grass areas. Every street's going to be different. Every street has different design constraints, but that's the intent. Um, when you dig up the street, and this is one of the things I was thinking about initially, um, is there any cost sharing that you can get from, let's say, consumer power, and you go, we need to replace our gas line? So the gas lines are under the sidewalk. Well, my gas line was, when they, when they, when they, I was here when they redid my street 20 years ago. Okay. And they broke my gas line. So I actually have a new one tomorrow. And they do want to be the side of the camp, but they, they, they tied in on my side and then on the, on the north side. So the, ga the main gas line goes on my side, and then everybody on the south side gets have to get tied in. But if you end up getting to that gas line, and they're just saying for cost sharing, if there's another grant out there talking about gas lines, go, well, we're going to get the gas lines, we're going to you know, implement that too or not. I, I don't think so. Um, now they're directional drilling or pulling under the streets. They don't really have to impact any streets. They've, they've replaced a number of services uh, over the past few years. And Consumers is, is ramping up to replace a lot of mains and services in the coming years. They'll be, uh, they'll be doing quite a bit of that this summer, actually. Um, and their process is, is, since I've been here for the last five years at least, is they disrupt sidewalks because that's where their main is. But in terms of running a service across the street, um, they do the same thing that we do, is you, you pothole on one side of the street and the other and then pull it through. So in terms of synergy, I don't think so. Um, we're, that's one of the things we're working with right now is to make sure that their gas lines are not where our water mains will be going. Um, but you know, we, we coordinate with them on projects, so we can, we can see as we get into the design for each one of them. And we've already been talking about, you know, our future projects with theirs as well. Um, other considerations are our mains are six inches in diameter and they're cast iron, so those corrode and become brittle. Current standards are eight inch uh, water mains for residential service, so we'll be bringing everything up to current standards. Um, it would be a PVC pipe that's been used for 70 years now. Um, so one of the biggest issues is our current peak hour pressure that's below 50 PSI. Um, that's still adequate pressure, but um, comparatively you can see where we have lower pressure in the system. Um, these are our current fire flows. We do have some pockets of poor fire flow um, at some various points in the city. We do have some gaps in our in our water uh, distribution system. Two things we'll address through this project. Uh, good things to do with a water system is to loop it to make sure that you've got water that can come from multiple directions. And we have some gaps right now that uh, we will be filling. So there's no water main along Woodward from Oakland Park to Elm Park. So as water travels to different parts of the system, everything that flows to the west side has to come down to Ridge. This will bridge that gap provide better service to the east side because there's two crossings. All the water we get flows from Sakwa's uh, distribution main. There's a 48 inch, 42 or 48 inch water pipe that runs down Woodward. We tap into it right here at the end of Oakland, or I'm sorry, at the end of uh, Oxford. And then all the water flows out. So to get across Woodward, it goes across uh, here in between Oxford and Cambridge to Woodward Heights, and then there's another crossing that uh, goes under the ditch. This is a newer one. This was put in when the ditch was built. So some of the water main on Woodward and across Woodward is newer, doesn't need to be replaced. So this will improve flow throughout the system, redundancy, and by adding a new uh, main along Indiana, we can improve pressure and looping uh, for the east side as well, because these are some pretty long runs. 
So current fire flow and then modeled fire flow, you can see the improvements. The only areas where we would have potentially some issues are at dead ends where we are not looped. So at the dead end here at Ridge and at the end of Woodward Heights, but everything else in the city would be um, fully looped at that point. So again, this is where the plan is changing. Uh, we had talked about a 30 year water system update to try to spread this over a long enough period of time that it was affordable on an annual basis while also trying to accomplish as best we could the, the state's 20 year mandate that we replace all lead service lines within 20 years. Uh, when's the state's mandate up? Is that, what year is that? It say? started in 2021, uh, so, so it'll be 2041. So, okay, so the, the clock starts ticking 2021. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, again, we're looking at applying for drinking water revolving loan fund money to try to get this project done in potentially five years okay. using money from that revolving loan fund. And then we would repay that probably over 20 years is their usual term. They can extend that to 30 years or sometimes 40, depending. Uh, we are not a disadvantaged community by the states or the federal laws, but uh, we, can, we will be making our case to try, to try to figure out what the most affordable way to, to pay for this will be. But the key thing is that they have the opportunity to give us grants or forgivable principal with some of the federal infrastructure money. So that's money where, that we have to apply through the Drinking Water Revolving Loan Fund. So if we can get our total cost you know, down, then our, our annual cost to repay that debt to the state becomes more affordable. Two, just two quick follow-up questions for that. Um, when will we know about these grants? I mean, this commission is only going to be active for a couple months. Will we know about those by then? You will not. And the second question is, I mean, our community, you look at our median income, what's, I know you won't give a number, what's the realistic percentage we'll see any of that money knowing that there's a lot more and larger disadvantaged communities throughout the state? Honestly, I mean, it just doesn't seem like the cards are there for us. You know, I, I, I was more um, of that opinion a few months ago than I am now. Okay. Good. Two reasons for that. One, the state did decide to allocate $1 billion from their uh, ARPA money mm -hmm. to the Drinking Water Revolving Loan Fund for lead service line replacement. Okay. And we know that the state is receiving significant money from the, from the federal infrastructure bill to also supplement the Drinking Water Revolving right. Loan Fund. I think the amount of money that's flowing into that fund should be enough that even, even we will qualify for some. And the important thing is they'll give us loans, but I yeah. want grants. Well, I think we all do. We all do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm more hopeful today than I was two months ago okay. that, that there will be a, the ability for us to access some of that. And we've been in, in, in communication with Eagle for two years now. They know, they know our issue, they know our problem. Um, they've acknowledged that, that what we have to do to get this project done is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm choosing my words carefully here, but <laughs> they, they're aware of our issues. So I'm hopeful that we have, we've, we've laid enough groundwork and support. So I don't know, I don't know if I wanna put odds on it or no. how much no. we would get, but I'm hopeful. But we won't know by the end of this commission. No, okay. we, we are in the process. Our final application will be done. Or it will be due, I believe, by August. Okay. So the process is we've already submitted our intent to apply. Okay. We will now start a series of meetings with Eagle to review the project and to, to start to get our application ready. Here in, here in Warren? Or Pardon? Eagle in, in Warren, their office in Warren or at, at the Lansing? Oh, uh, it's with the Lansing. Okay. They, they assigned somebody. Okay. So, and everything's virtual now with them. So yeah. it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. But uh, I can let you know how those, you know, what, what those are looking like as they, as they move along. I think that'll have a big impact on what we're doing too. Well, I, Absolutely. Yeah, and I want to reiterate a, a secondary, but it becomes really important based on your question, John, task or objective of this group. Mm -hmm. We will come up with some type of how the, the funds of the city will afford this project based on an annual payback number that we have to reach so there'll be a loan there'll be an annual payment due you will figure out with the funds available that the city has levers to bring in revenue how to fund that annual payment then a very important question specifically based on jim's just report that maybe everybody's going to get something right from the state how would you adjust those levers proportionately 
Are you just going to say, you know, whatever dollar we get from the state, apply it across all of the levers proportionally? Or you might say, first go to the lever that is a flat rate or the lever that is a millage or the lever that is a whatever the levers Jim will tell us about at the end of this meeting, go to that one first. Right. That is a debate that we or discussion that we will have as part of our recommendation to the commission so that when August comes and then results come in October and then you actually know towards the end of maybe 2022, maybe, um, they have some direction as the policy making body of how this committee considered that question even without the data at the time. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I mean, we're look, you're looking for one recommendation, but this is almost an if-then statement saying, if we don't get any grant money, this is the path we need to go down. If we do get grant money, this is how we can potentially augment it or call it what you want. So I know you're looking for one recommendation, but it's kind of a, if we get this or if we don't get this, it's kind of a couple of different routes we can take here. Correct. You, you are very accurate. Okay. Let's call it one recommendation that includes an if and a then. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Thank you. Jim, one more. Uh, did I hear you correctly that you said you would try to uh, get this entire project done within five years? That would be our goal. And there's two, two, two reasons for that. One, because removing all the lead is a public health benefit. Yep. But two, the federal infrastructure bill is funding the drinking water revolving loan fund for five years. So it's not a one-time cash infusion that that fund gets. It, it's coming over the course of five years and five installment payments. So we figure we will structure our application so that hopefully each year we're getting a little bit of that as it replenishes. So the tentative schedule of streets that you had placed out some months ago, that's no longer valid? Maybe, maybe not. So again, that's one of those things that we, we read and react. Okay. And I'll talk, I was going to talk a little bit about that next, but you're, you're right, you know, that may adjust. So if we know that we've got the, the wherewithal to do this project within five years, we are no longer beholden. Before, our, our schedule was more being driven by which streets had the most lead service lines. There's not, we're starting with Kensington, and there's not a lot of system benefit to starting with Kensington because it's, it's sort of off on, a, on the edge of the city. But we can only generate enough money to replace a lot of these longer streets uh, every other year. So if we have a certain number of lead service lines we're supposed to be replacing each year, we're starting with the highest concentration of lead service lines so that we can get out to a lead for our replacement requirement um, and then, then start to attack some of the lower density lead streets, for lack of a better way of explaining it. Sorry to keep jumping in. Just one question. If we don't meet these deadlines, what's, what's the stick that the, 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 the DEQ is taking or Eagle's taking on this? I mean, is there penalties? Is there pun I mean, I'm just... Trying to get an idea, you know. Are There's, they could fine us. Okay. They can fine us for noncompliance. Okay. And ultimately, at the end of the day, there's revenue sharing that they could okay. hold over our head as well. Okay. Um, tactically or strategically, not doing it in the hopes that they would help us do it probably won't fly for us. Well, I'm not advocating <laughs> that. I'm just, I'm just curious. Right. Uh, but, but, you're, but, Jay, to your point, um, if we know that we're getting this, you know, in the first five years, we might look at doing some different things first. Building out, you know, a, a, a system to improve water pressure throughout the city first or in our first year of projects and then kind of, you know, adding on to those branches with other projects. It, we'll have to decide what the best way of approaching that will be. So again, this tentative project plan, it was tentative, and it may or may not still be the case. And this infrastructure bill, um, yes, we've talked about all this already. So the scope of the, uh, of the issue, you can see our current and future uh, water expenditures, and just how big of an increase that is from our water fund. We do have an infrastructure millage. That's still paying for street maintenance, uh, and there's not a lot of available money there uh, to allocate here and cuts. So let's talk about funding. I'm going to call this the infrastructure ramp up. I want everyone to understand that we, we talked a lot during the fall leading into the election about how much the millage would raise, what we needed to do with it, the fact that it's an $850,000 a year um, project to, to do the water mains. 
But the water mains are part of our overall infrastructure spend. This is the water and sewer fund. We're taking care of sewers. We have other infrastructure needs we have to do. So for this group, I think I'd like to reframe the discussion, if we can, around our infrastructure spend every year. Because we have existing sources of revenue that are flowing into the water fund to do infrastructure. And then there's a new need that we have to fill. And that those existing sources are doing water infrastructure, but also some sewer infrastructure. And at the end of the day, our infrastructure spend is, uh, ends up being one total amount. So we did a sewer cleaning and televising project. That was a four-year project. We went through and looked at all of our sewers, jetted them out, took video, uh, and then did, we have some infrastructure priorities there for addressing issues in our sewer system. That was about $60,000 a year. And our plan is to do a 10-year cycle to do that every 10 years to make sure we stay on top of things. We've been doing repair and lining since 2018. Um, in a lot of cases, we'll do a liner in the sewers. It's a product that they put in and then flash it with steam and it expands and uh, solidifies around the inside of the pipe. And it's like having a brand new sewer pipe. But your sewers have to be in good enough shape to be able to do that. If you have discontinuities or sometimes they round or oval or there'll be a shift in a sewer, you can't line because then it can't grab on. So one of the things we did this fall was on a couple of streets, Elm Park and Oakland Park. We did some open cut digs to fix some of those sections of sewer so that we can then go back and line them in the future. So we are just repairing some segments to be able to do the lining. That's just an example of our ongoing sewer maintenance project. Um, and we're spending 100 to $175,000 a year on that. Probably closer to $175,000 a year looking at our, at our need going forward. We did a water meter replacement just uh, recently. That was a $400,000 one-time expense, so we were building up to that. Our water rates were increasing over about three years because we do a three-year rate model. And now that that project's done, that money is being reallocated to water infrastructure. And we've been doing about $80,000 of lead service line replacement already um, to meet the state requirements that started last year. So when you look at this, it's about one million and change every year. Uh, going forward, we expect about 57% of that to be water mains. Sewer maintenance is 15%. And then your private and public service lines together, about 28%. 22% is uh, public service line expense. Our baseline revenue, when I talk about baseline, I'm talking about our 2020 water rates. So those ended on uh, July 1 of 2021. They provided about $410,000 of annual infrastructure funding. Um, $290,000 of that came from the ready to serve charge that is on the bill. And then $120,000 came from the water and sewer usage rate. That rate, rate was $78.75 combined water and sewer. About $12 of that was for water and uh, sewer infrastructure improvements. And then the remaining $66.75 funded all of the operations, sewerage treatment, wholesale water purchase, really everything else that the water fund does. So our new funding need really was about $595,000 a year. Uh, the millage would have raised about $622,000 if levied in full um, during the first year. The water and sewer rate was increased. So right now uh, we're paying $106.15 per unit of water you use plus an $82.50 per bill ready to serve charge. Um, it's it's not a structure that I like, but it's a structure that we had to use because this is a project with external deadlines that we are not choosing. So we've talked about all this. I won't talk about it more. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is we did get a $650,000 federal earmark for Kensington. I, don't, I shouldn't say we got it. We are in the process and hopefully we'll get it. Um, Last summer, uh, Congressman Levin's office put out a call for projects. Congress brought back earmarks after about 12 years. Uh, they received, uh, I think, around three dozen projects. They picked 10. So ours was one of three dozen that they picked to move forward. Out of those 10, nine of them made it out of their House committees, and then the House approved a spending bill, uh, including funding for $650,000 for our Kensington project. That has been sitting in the Senate for, I think, about four months now and no idea when or if that's gonna move or if that'll ever, ever actually happen uh, or if our Kensington water main project will be completed before that moves anywhere, but um, there'll be a new Congress before that happens. So we're hopeful, but again, 
waiting. So funding options. As we've looked at this, and as you look at what communities do to fund their water infrastructure, there's usage rate, there are charges. Uh, we've used a ready to serve flat fee. There are also maybe some cost per increment charges you could do that relate to some characteristic of the property. Stormwater, a number probably five or six years ago, we changed how we collect for stormwater runoff to an equivalent residential unit methodology. That looked at the size and area and impervious surface for parcels in each neighborhood of the city and then established a, a equivalent residential unit number for each parcel in the city. And that's how we apportion our stormwater runoff costs. That's more or less a cost per increment way of apportioning those costs where there's some rational nexus between the property characteristics and the service um, incurred. So that was not something that we specifically talked about during the millage process, but it was something that's been brought up. What about a front foot fee? So what's the rational nexus for a water and sewer project? Well, it's really mostly the length of the water main or the sewer you're replacing. So if you have 30 feet of frontage or 150 feet of frontage, your proportion of that cost is different. So if we levy a, a, a charge based on the linear frontage of your property, maybe that's a more equitable way of doing it. So that's something that was, has been talked about and that I think we can look at and would love to hear your thoughts on that or any other method of doing that. Of course, then we have the millage and then other, other things we maybe haven't thought about, other ways of doing this. Every combination of funding sources impacts each house differently. We have taxable value, we have water usage, we have frontage. Um, there's a lot of different things that all come together to determine what each house's um, costs are. So I've talked about rational nexus. Is there some connection between the charge and the benefit you receive? Um, fairness is a consideration and something that I think has been debated. Uh, what does fair mean? So is the method as fair as possible and how are we defining fair? And then predictability. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues with raising this revenue for, through a usage rate is that you can get into demand destruction. Uh, as your cost per water uh, unit increases, people cut back on their water usage, revenue falls, we have to increase costs further. So that you can chase your tail on that. Um, predictability is an important thing when we're talking particularly about a long-term infrastructure project that's going to have somewhat fixed annual costs. Adjacent considerations. We have taxable value differences. Uh, we know that two identical houses next door to each other are going to have different taxable values depending on when each one has most recently sold. Um, you know, the effect of Headley and Prop A is a whole other thing. Uh, when a home sale goes and that taxable value pops from $100,000 to $300,000, the city gets a little bit of that benefit. But really what it does is it reduces the taxable or the uh, millage rate. So all your neighbors benefit from that house being sold by the millage rate being reduced. One of the things we see is if you live in, in town for a long time, your annual tax payment to the city doesn't increase much every year, if at all. Uh, the city is only about 50% of your total tax payment. But because of the Headley reducing our millage rates, um, once you bear the burden of that pop-up when you buy your house, your annual tax payments stay fairly consistent um, to the city. Jim, um, I think you answered this question leading up to the millage and all that, but just to make sure of it, was the calculation built into the amount of the ask to account for Headley reduction? So Headley allows the city to uh, increase our collections every year by the rate of inflation. So there's not much to be built in. Our tax collections go up by the rate of inflation. And then if home sales would, co would cause our, so say, say every year our, our tax revenue increased by $100, or inflation would allow it to increase by $100. But home sales increasing the taxable value in the city increase our taxable value by 10%. Our tax, our tax collections would increase by $500. What happens is that Headley reduces the uh, tax rate so that we only collect an extra $100 and that other $400 is distributed to everybody else in the city by that millage rate reducing down. Um, so we increase our collections at the rate of inflation. Everybody else in the city benefits from the 
the taxable value pop up through that reduced millage rate. Does that make sense to everybody? Like some like intro to Headley or just some sort of overview you could sort of share uh, in the files? That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So when we talk about some of these different ways of handling these costs, uh, one of the things that I'm going to put into the drive uh, after this meeting is a spreadsheet tool where you can go in and put in different rate structures. You can put in different ready to serve amounts. You can put in different water usage rates, different millage rates, or even a front foot charge. Um, and combine those together to try to you know, get to one million and change of revenue every year for infrastructure and see how those different combinations uh, impact all of the different households across the community. In order, as a, by way of introduction to that, uh, what I did is present four scenarios here. The 2021 rate structure that's currently in place, and then three uh, scenarios that maximize one of these levers. As we go through the discussions, if there's another funding source or another way of doing this that, we, that comes up, we can amend and adjust the tool to add that in. So you can add that to the mix to look at that as well. Uh, so by no means is this you know, a, a closed book, but this is the starting point. And for each of these scenarios, you can see we maximized one of the uh, levers. So this is where you maximize the millage if we levy the full 3.5 mils under this scenario. Under the ready to serve charge, if we say we wanna raise all the money, we'll hold the usage rate at $12 constant, but raise all of the rest of the money from a flat fee, then your ready to serve charge goes to $128.06 per bill. And similarly, if you wanna do it all through a front foot charge, it's $13.09. And then the bottom table shows you what percentage of that total infrastructure funding is coming from each source. So even under the full 3.5 millage, that's about 60% of the revenue. The other 30% is coming from that flat ready to serve charge um, at the 4250 from the 2020 rates. And then 12% from the usage rate. Same thing, 88% of the revenue comes from the two flat charges. What does that look like? Um, in the tool, there are cost and percent increase histograms for all of the houses in the community. So under the 2021 rates, the distribution for dollar cost increase looks like this. And if you can't read it from where you're sitting, uh, this is $1,000 to $1,100 cost increase. This is 400 to 500. Your percent cost increase, um, you've got five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, 10 to 11. So this allows you to begin to compare how these different scenarios play out. The full 3.5 mil millage, um, this is one thing on the next two slides. Let's talk about fare, because that's one of the things that we've got into is how do you define fare? And I will fully admit, when I was looking at this, I came at it as a fair thing was, in, was, was holding most constant the percent increase. With the thinking, the, the, the concept, the theory underlying this is that we've all chosen a level of expenditure with our water usage, with the house we buy, the taxes we pay. Uh, and so a one argument is the most fair way of, of apportioning this is making sure that everybody's percentage increase over that baseline you've chosen um, is as equal as possible. So that leads to, the millage leads to a very clustered percent increase. Everyone's pretty much between five and 8% increase. The cost increase is the distribution is a little wider and you can see there's a peak here. A lot of people pay between three and $400 extra a year. And then you start to get out uh, towards the tail a little bit. You have some people between 17 and $1,800 uh, a year of increase. The converse argument is that it's most fair if everybody pays the exact same dollar amount every year. With the flip side being that your percent cost increase is much more distributed. You've got 15 people who would see more than a 19% increase each year. So your distribution here is much wider, but here it's much narrower. So you can see these two slides um, <clears throat> highlight the, really the flip side of the coin here. So what is most fair? I don't know, that's what you're here for. 
The frontage charge, uh, one of the things that is common in town is there are some very common lot widths, 30 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet, uh, and then you jump up and there's uh, some 100 foot. So when you levy, you can see that with these consistent bars at certain levels when you levy a cost based on your frontage charge. And again, your percent increase histogram is kind of somewhere in between those previous two. A little more clustered than the everyone pays the same amount option, but certainly more varied <clears throat> than the uh, millage option. Jim, your example is, is that uh, type of charge is looking at just the width of the property, not the distance from the property to the state of stop box where it connects, right? Correct. The cost to replace the service line at that point necessarily. We're looking at the water main primarily. Right. Correct, because you're right. Looking at the length of your service line isn't particularly meaningful. And again, you know, that's not really something anyone can control, which side of the street the water main's on. But the, the cost to replace a private service line um, and the cost to replace a public service line, when these are bid out, it's typically a unit cost. And it's, if it's less than 30 feet, it's X. If it's more than 30 feet, it's Y. So it's not, okay, it's, you know, Z dollars per foot for that, that it's, it's typically a unit cost kind of thing. We could look at trying to do that, but I can't tell you how long everybody's public and private service lines are right now. I, I don't know that we could, I mean, we don't have as built from the 1924 water mains, which were laid by guys with a horse-drawn carriage. Um, so, you know, that, that is a, a I understand you know, that is a rational part of the cost apportionment. Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but it seems like given that there, the expectation is that the lead service lines are replaced at public cost. So it seems to me, if we did something that was wildly disproportionate, depending on how long your yard was, that might, if I had a very yard, long yard, I might raise my hand and say, well, that's not, that's disproportionate. It's really not public cost. I'm paying more than Jim, whose house is close to the street. So just a thought. Yes, and it, it does raise a concern. One of the things I explored with the city attorney a year ago was, can we create different rate classes? So I have a lead service line. I don't have a lead service yeah. line. Or you know, a way of special assessing this. And the city attorney's opinion was based on the language that's in the administrative rule at public cost, means that his opinion was we couldn't create different classes for you know lead service line versus non-lead service line. It's it's we're all in this together, and you know there has to be some charging on a per foot or frontage basis. Probably okay, the city attorney feels, but on other considerations it can get a little trickier. That's my real question. So are we moving ahead with that understanding that we think that would be acceptable? To, to go that way because like say the ERU comparison we were able to create these neighborhoods of classes and that was okay but here we can't but maybe we can do this other thing so do we know for sure that we can do that if we wanted to do that the the city attorney's, attorney's opinion is is some sort of thing like a frontage charge basis is okay okay because that that still meets the public cost mm -hmm. you know the front of your property is the front of your property it's not related to how long your service line is not related to other things that you maybe can't control. We all have this amount of frontage and we're this percentage of the total system. So the total system costs go in and then you pay your proportion based on that. Not, well, there's the total system, but also we're gonna carve out these special charges that are based on you know, whether you have lead or not. There's a difference there. Okay. Is, there is there any concern that that would be considered a disguised tax and be an invalid user fee based on the Bolt case? So since it is kind of you're assessing basing on a property attributes that maybe the nexus, as you mentioned before, isn't strong enough to say, okay, this is, they would might look at this and say, oh, it's really a disguised tax and it isn't approved by the voters. Absolutely. There is a risk of that. Okay. Now, you know, it's managing risk. And, and, and yep. so the city attorney's opinion on that was that generally the courts have given leeway in rate setting to... You know, they, they assume that, that the, the uh, methodology is valid. Doesn't mean we can't be challenged on it, won't have to defend it, and that there'd be uncertainty that's, okay. that's involved there. Uh, but yes, that's absolutely a question I have for the city attorney as well. 
you know, can have him come talk to you about those things, uh, but I, I wouldn't be presenting things that he had put the kibosh on. Yeah, and you don't know until it gets challenged a lot of times. Exactly. So, you know, would I be, uh, would I have a little concern, you know? I have a lot of little concerns about a lot of things uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and this would be one of them, but is it disqualifying? I don't think so. Okay. Can, can I just get back to fairness a little bit? So when you, you talk about fairness, you have a demand on the system as a whole. So those homes that have, let's say, four or five water closets, maybe three, four shower heads, that have the biggest, bigger service leads going into them, they're, they have a greater, I would assume, they have a greater demand on the system. So as we talk about fairness, it, it, it get back, it, kind of correlates back to taxable value because if you have a, a larger house, you're going to have more water closets, you're going to have more shower heads, you're going to be putting a bigger demand on the system. <coughs> and can that be another way to look at fairness? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to you guys to... Well, and that's, to I, I yeah. guess I'm throwing it out to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a factor of maybe heading into the water rate. The more you use, the more you pay, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll just I, jump in. I, I think that's, that's absolutely the right question to be asking. Which way is most fair? Is there a blend? Um, and, and yeah, set, hold that, that thought for, uh, for that discussion. Quick clarification. Okay. All the service leads within the house, they're all the same size, correct? Going from the street to the house, they're all the same size. No, they're not. No? No. no. So uh, that's one of the things when we replace all of the public side leads, they'll be increased. Generally, they're three quarters inch or maybe an inch, depending, mm -hmm. because they're older. They'll all be, they'll, uh, they'll all be upsized to one inch services. And, and some people do have, have paid to increase the size of their service into the house. Okay. Um, it, you know, it only really matters if you're using a lot of water, um, yeah. but yeah, if you have 10 bathrooms, but one person living there, I mean, it's, it's no different. Five people living in a house with one bathroom. Correct. Or it is different, but the usage, so, okay. Right. Uh, but no, everyone does not have the same size service. Okay. Thank you. But if I heard you correct, at the end of the project, people will. Hmm. Typically, yeah. We'll be putting in one inch, we'll be putting in new one inch services. One inch services. Now, if you have a copper line that's still a five eighths or three quarters, we're not gonna replace that. No. But you'll have a one inch up to the stop box. Okay. Um, so that will be standard. Okay. Gotcha. And of course, if somebody has paid to upgrade their service to a two inch copper line, we would have to put in a two inch service for, for them, but those are things we'll have to figure out. Okay. Um, so that's really all I had. Uh, James already touched on this. The dollar cost is uh, an unknown. So every year what that dollar cost is actually going to be, we say one point, you know, one million and change right now. If we get six million dollars of grant funding from the state, then that might look different. Yeah. Um, if something else happens and it's one point one million instead of one point oh oh five million, that looks different. So um, you know, as I approach this, one option would be to look at a percentage mix. We had those tables at the beginning. These rates equate to this percentage of funding being provided. That's an easy way of saying, okay, do, you know, 30% this, 50% that, 20% the other thing. And then every year we just take those costs and reduce everything accordingly. That's one approach. James is correct. You could also say, okay, well, do this mix and then any money we get reduces this thing first. Um, those are two general ways you could attack this thing. Um, and I'm glad James talked about those as well. So that's all I had. I know that was quite a bit. Let me um, flip over real quick. Yeah, to the, to the tool. I apologize, I have to uh, head off. I have an emergency. <coughs> so this is what you're gonna see. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Call it a tool because it sounds good. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. The table is everybody's 
frontage, taxable value, the assessed value, uh, and the total annual water usage for that property. And then there's some calculation columns. Uh, baseline annual ready to serve plus usage. So this is your baseline water costs using those 2020 rates. And then the proposed based on whatever scenario you're creating over here. The baseline tax based on the taxable value and the uh, current annual city taxes. No, I'm sorry, total tax rate, not just city. This is total taxes that you pay to everybody. And then the proposed tax, what that would adjust to based on whatever millage rate you put in the tool. So then there's the baseline total water and tax payments and then your proposed total water and tax payments that flows through to a dollar increase and a percentage increase for all properties. These are the four cells that we've built that you can create your own scenarios with. So <clears throat> here we see that the 2021 water rates are a little bit short. There's a little bit of a funding gap. So these were the maximized scenarios that we created. So the maximum frontage charge option you see there is at $13.08, and it ends up being $138. The maximum flat ready to serve option with the $128.06 ready to serve the bill gets us to that one million change. Full millage option, same thing, gets us here. So you can create any one of these blended options you want. You can say I want a $5 per front foot fee. $50 flat ready to serve. And then I'm going to take this back to 12. And then I need 1.3. And okay, not bad. So you kind of have to brute force it. You could do a solver for this if you wanted, but it's just easy to brute force it as well and get yourself close to, uh, to where you need to be. And then those histograms are down here so you can start to look at you know how does that dollar cost spread look how does that percentage increase spread look you know, these are a little tighter than the full millage option so maybe this is good and you can see here then you also have those tables where you can see what the some of the data um, it tells you we're we're generating three hundred thirty seven thousand dollars from the flat uh, the frontage based fee and so on <clears throat> and then you can also see what percentage of the revenue is coming from all the sources. So somehow I ended up completely randomly ending up with 34% from the two um, charges. Gives you your average residential increase. One thing to keep in mind is that these are going to look a little bit different because this is the residential increase, but we also have commercial properties that contribute at different levels depending on the funding mix you use. So some of these will move a little bit more of the cost to industrial or commercial properties. Some of it will move a little bit more of the cost to residential properties. Um, and this is your statistical spread and then your average percent, um, percent residential increases. So I know under this scenario that 95% of people in the city are going to see between a 3.6 and 10.6% cost increase or between $189 and $819 dollar cost increase. So those are some of the things you can do with the tool. Feel free, go in there, noodle around with it. You know, maybe this can help sharpen your thinking or generate some ideas. Do you think you could add um, comments slash notes to each of those um, descriptions next to the cells, you know, where you hover your mouse on it and it explains more what your abbreviations actually mean? So for example, where it says 95% uh, CI low, I may not know what that means right off the bat. So if you put a little comment in the cell, you know, to where I hover on it, it gives me more information that might help me out. Sure. Okay, thanks. I want to reiterate something I think Jim mentioned, but after this meeting, this tool will be put into the Google Drive. So it's really important if you haven't accessed the Google Drive yet, which was in the email that Jim sent you, please do so as soon as you can after this meeting. Um, actually, I take that back. Please do so sometime tomorrow afternoon, <laughs> because at the same time you do that, you're going to check and make sure that you can access um, the Excel spreadsheet that Jim's going to also put in there, along with the presentation he gave tonight. 
um, and we're going to keep adding to that Google Drive. But your homework between now or when this meeting concludes and our next meeting, which we will set at the end of this meeting, is to literally play with the tool. There's nothing you can do to break it. If you break it, we'll put, we'll put it back in. Um, and then what I hope to do is actually project this tool during our meeting. And so as you play with it over the next week or however long till we set our next meeting, we can then have some of these discussions. I would like to open our next meeting, as I mentioned, with uh, election of, of officers. I wouldn't mind having a discussion, and again, I'll leave it to the members, about fairness from a philosophical level, and then go into maybe some people's, what you played with or what you'd like to see on the board demonstrated for your fellow members of what you thought was fair, or at least something for, to throw out for discussion, and really make that a working discussion so that by the end of the next meeting, we are at least coming around with, okay, I'm understanding where my peers are coming from. I need to think through this tool some more, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, I, I throw it back to the members. Does that sound like a reasonable approach based on what Jim has just provided you of our next steps? And, and I can't stress enough the tool that's being provided to you um, really should help our discussion. Without it, um, you know, it, it would be a little bit more ethereal, where in this case, we'll start it at philosophical, but we'll be able to get to real by next meeting. I, I think that's a wise yeah. progression. Absolutely. I just wanted to ask, with the residential calculation, and you just mentioned how it's been in my mind, that automatically factors in how it, how it affects the commercial side too? It does. We don't present that because commercial is kind of the tail on, on the dog in Pleasant Ridge. But it, it's, I mean, it generally, you see it doesn't move it much, right? It's $495. Uh, average residential increase versus 504 versus 513. The annual dollar amounts are like $20 either way. So we're not, I'm not concerned that we are penalizing or, uh, you know, hurting our commercial or overburdening them. The amounts are, are fairly small with that. Because I was wondering about, you know, everything on the other side of the burial tracks for uh, fire drenches. Does that is that all part of the system too, or because they're on the other side of the railroad tracks, are they dealt with permanently? Interestingly, both. So yes, they are on the other side of the tracks. They are on our system. When that project came in, we could not supply them with adequate fire flow. They opened up a they opened up two fire hydrants at Iron Ridge, and people on Elm Park Avenue were calling in saying, "I was taking a shower and all my water's gone." So opening up fire hydrants over at Iron Ridge cratered water pressure on the entire other side of town. So we, couldn't, we could not supply them with adequate uh, fire flow. They couldn't do fire suppression over there. They couldn't redevelop their properties or use their properties because they couldn't meet code because we couldn't supply the water. So the, I'm sorry, this is a long answer to a fairly short question, but the answer was they are connected to the Ferndale water system for fire suppression. They have a separate water main loop that they had to build at their own expense to supply water to their, to their system. But they're on our system for daily usage. They pay taxes to us. They're all part of. They're all part of this mix. So we hope as they fill up those buildings and people start to use more water over there, it'll be a good thing because that helps everybody. What additional information are you planning on giving us, or or have you put on the table what you think we need, and you're going to wait for us to ask for more? I think we've put out what, what you need. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of information in the Google Drive. There's also a lot of information that was present, presented during the millage, which remains valid. Background information, not just about the millage, but the project as a whole, uh, on the website, citypleasantridge.org slash water. So at this point, I'm looking to you to, to let, for you to let me know what, what else you need and want to see. I had problems finding the millage fact sheet when I was searching your website. Could you put that on the Google Drive? Sure. Yeah. And then by chance, in the engineering estimates that you have, the, the, the way I saw the information, and maybe I missed this, is it was given to us by street. Is there a breakdown of the cost by the system as a whole 
and what benefits each resident. So as a total though, so the system improvements, individual service lead line costs, is that broke down in the engineering estimates? Um, no, it's not, it's not um, currently presented that way. Okay. It was done on a project basis. Okay. We could, I'm sure we could have them. I'm just thinking in them. the fairness discussion, that's some information we might want to look at. We might want to look at funding the system improvements one way, and then the lead service lines, although it's all a public cost, in another way. Just, I'm thinking, I'm going back to our philosophical discussion for fairness. How would you, what would you include in each one of those categories? Well, I would, the system improvements to me would be the looped system, where you're going to add the new lines, where you're improving all of the existing main lines, um, fire hydrants, is I would see as part of the system. Um, I would s stop boxes, I'm not sure if you would look at that as a system or an individual household. The, I, I would think that would be a small cost to the project. But then to, to take out the um, cost of the service lead lines, public and private. So the public service lines are, with the water main replacement are going to be replaced regardless sure. of whether it's lead or not. Right. Um, so I, I wonder if that is then a system cost or a, you know, per residence. I would leave it up to the expert, the engineer. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I know just enough about this to be dangerous. Yeah. I, I can tell you the engineer will be, how do you want that classified? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can just, okay, let me, let me look at that. Let me think about that. And I guess just one last maybe question comment I have is the linear footage. To me that sounds an awful lot like a special assessment district. And I don't know if that makes a difference, but I don't really see a correlation between how much footage you own compared to the benefit of the system. So kind of a comment, just something to think about as we're talking again about fairness. Yeah, I think that came up in all of the discussion and the debate leading up to the millage. And it was a way, I think, for people who had smaller houses to say, well, that still would allow me to pay less than somebody who has a much larger property. It was, I think, a way of just intuitively, it felt like another way for people who were not necessarily comfortable with the millage as a way to to balance that. And again, I don't know that it makes complete sense. It was just kind of came up as part of that discussion. So I guess a lot of how it ended up here. Okay. So Thank you. People were just looking for some way for people who have larger, more expensive houses to pay more proportionally than somebody who had a smaller house. So it seemed like a possibility. Okay. Jim, uh, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, does the city have any kind of idea how much of the water main is not in front of someone's house? Now, isn't there, a, I don't know how sizable this portion would be, but connectors or segments that are you know, not in front of my house, so I'm not being charged for that, but someone is. So that much we'd have to account for somehow. How much is that? Like 10% of the system is that type of thing? Or? What would you guess? Or is there a way you can look that up and figure that out? Yeah, just be looking at the map and measuring yeah. it. I, mean, I know we have mains that are along 10 mile. So those aren't really servicing anybody other than looping. Uh, there are the Indiana water main we'd build for system pressure. Uh, the uh, crossings across Woodward. So I, I don't know what the percentage is. get into this discussion of lineal feet in front of someone's yeah. house or whatever, we will also have to account for how much is not in front of someone's house mm -hmm. and how do we pay for that. So just a thought on that. Um, mm -hmm. So I will, I will say, what I, to, to double back, yep. the, when we talk about linear feet, 
the, that is based on the total frontage of parcels in the city. So what you do is you'd say, okay, well, the system as a whole is this, and then my percentage of that is, you know, this. I'm point. So I have 50 feet of frontage, and there's 67,000 feet of frontage for all parcels in the city. So I'm 0.000234%. Now the overall system cost, right, because maintaining the gate valve at Oxford is a system cost, replacing that, replacing the distribution system to get the water to your house is all part of the overall system cost. So if we all proportionally bear our share based on our frontage relative to all the other parcels in the city, then you know maybe it matters what's actually in front of a house versus not. Or, way to create a multiplier for what you're paying. Exactly. You're paying for this much only, Correct. nothing more. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And just when I heard it and I'm thinking about it, I think of it as that we're figuring out a way to divvy up the costs in a fair way. And one way was, well, taxable value of the home. But, you know, that's, it can be sort of arbitrary based on time. But if you look at the linear feet in front of a house, that's also a proxy for density. And infrastructure provided in a high density area versus something that's less dense, you know, you're, you've got more you know, expensive. Um, but, that is true. but not as a precise measurement. You know, you know, if somebody has a larger lot, they enjoy the larger lot. And, uh, you know. So this is, this is the extreme example with the everyone pays the exact same amount, is that Kensington would generate three times as much annual revenue as another street in town that I won't name that has a very similar length, but many fewer houses. So, you know, is it is, is that fair that one street's paying $15,000 a year collectively and another street's paying $45,000 a year? Or what amounts to the same, you know, there's more service line leads on one street versus another. So there are some differences, but that's a consideration. Yeah, it just seems as we go forward with this, it's implement building. As in, we can slice and dice this so many different ways, but is there a point where it just gets ridiculous where, you know, this and this and this, all these factors? Are we going to try to consider how, we, how you, the city, can implement this in a fair way rather than 100 different uh, uh, calculations, who gets what or who has to pay for what? We, I think we need to look at how, we can, we, how you, the city, can implement this. Well, I agree. <laughs> 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 so you'll be able to give us input on our suggestions as we're creating them during our meetings and absolutely feasible this is feasible that sort of feedback right so that's why i added the frontage here it's something we know it's yeah. something that you know we can implement so i added it in here if there's other things we want to look at i'll let you know if you know the the, the length of your service lead is another thing that i that has been suggested and i under i understand that i have concerns with how accurately and uh, mm -hmm. we can implement that so if, if I may supplement that, Jim, the tool includes vetted ways that it could be implemented. So the, the options that exist in there, you should not concern about how you splice those because they've been vetted for implementation. If we have a third or, or I'm sorry, a fourth or fifth, that is where Jim's input becomes more critical. So these levers that are provided to you, feel free to, to, to adjust as you want the city has tools to implement. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. And, and we're not going to address, like, even the six, 650000 that may or may not come from the Senate or, or any other kind of possible funds. We're just going, we need a million five every year or whatever. What's the best way to implement? I think the million five is kind of a, a, a step in getting you to your final thing because I hope we need $800,000 a year after we get some outside money. Have the discussion about you know if that million turns into eight hundred thousand, you know then how do we, how do things? But, but at the same time, it could be a million too because costs could go up. It could be, right? And and I appreciated John's phraseology on the if then we will we will first do, the the million dollars or the number that's that's in the Excel spreadsheet, then with whatever time and capacity we have left as a group, we can talk about what if it goes down? How is that proportioned? What does it go up? What is that proportion um, as we give that feedback to the policymakers? But the first goal is, is the fixed amount, and then we'll, we'll go from there. And I, I'm just, uh, just doubling down in, in 
the fact that I think all of the other possibilities of any other shared cost has been vetted, and that's really not possible. Right. The, the question with shared costs is what can we do that somebody else is doing where there's overlap in the impact? And I look at it when, they, when, you know, 20 years ago when they redid our streets, that's the time we should have done this then. I mean, they tore up all our streets and they did, you know, and at the same time they, they did my gas line only because they broke it. They didn't do everybody's gas line. Right. I think they did the guy across the street and that's all they did. Um, so is, while you're there, is there anything else that needs to be done at that point, well, if that needs to be done, somebody else can share that cost. Right. And that would be in the engineering aspect, which I, you know. Right. With the, with the almost uh, absolute use of directional drilling and pulling technologies now where they're not trenching or, or cutting things up as much, um, you know, it gets less overlap in terms of synergies for cost sharing. You're right. You know, when you tear up a street and you've got everything out of the way already, that it, there's some synergy in just doing the water main. But... That's not where we are. Jim, just, just a technical question on, or quite clarification, on the frontage thing, what about a corner lot? How is that figured? Correct. So in the calculations, all this looks at is your front, front your, okay. your address street or your front. So you're it, not penalized if you've got a corner. We're not penalizing corner lots because okay. yeah, I, I, I threw that in here for a few of them and... <laughs> <laughs> I get a few that it would be like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so my question on the total revenue amount, does that consider the uh, the financing costs if we go through uh, the DWFR one? So the, that amount is based on our pay-go okay. option. The, that's one of the things we have to look at when we start to see what the package the state offers is. Yeah. You know, the financing charge is going to be there. What's the grant and you know loan that hopefully offsets that yep. and makes this more affordable? What's kind of the? It's been a while since, like a year and a half since I looked at any of this. What's the? I know their interest rates are incredibly low. They are. What is it currently at? I believe they're around two percent still. Two percent still. Yeah. Okay. So the benefit there is you're locking in. I mean, you're you're financing and you're locking in current infrastructure costs. Yep. So you're hopefully protecting yourself against you know concrete going up another hundred percent in three yep. years or something like that. But yeah. You know, especially with their just interest rates, it's, you know, it makes it a lot more palatable. Right. And hopefully they stay that way for the next, <laughs> well, 18 months. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> hopefully. Is it fair to assume that reliability of collection of payment is the same, whether it's a millage rate or water and sewer charge? In Pleasant Ridge? Yeah. Yes. That's what I thought, I yes. guess. And we, we roll unpaid tax, unpaid water bills to taxes. Right. So okay, right. we collect it eventually. Okay. But it's, our, our delinquencies are very low here. It's okay. That's what I assume, but I just wanted it to be confirmed. Good question. All right. I'm going to take this pause for a second um, as indication that I can, can jump in. Um, we're going to have these committee meetings as long as this body would like to. Uh, my goal is going to be two hours. Um, if we're a little bit more, if we're a little bit less, and we're making progress or we come to a lull when we need more information, we'll, we'll make the break at that point. I know myself, about two hours I start to zone out, no matter how interesting the infrastructure project is. <laughs> um, what I, what, so your, would you mind pulling up the drive real quick? What I, your, your homework out of today, to reiterate myself one more time, is to make sure you have access to the drive tomorrow afternoon and make sure you can see the model in the drive um, once, once it's placed there at, uh, tomorrow morning. Moving to our next agenda item, it's setting our meeting schedule. Um, when you completed your application to the city to be on this committee, um, you provided available evenings. Generally, the evening of Tuesday, which is how we circled into this date, was the most commonly available. Not perfectly available, but most commonly available. And I, I just wanted to um, ask this group if that remains the case. That's question one to give me feedback to. Question two to give me feedback to is cadence. Um, my hope is that we can kind of start 
with a weekly schedule or if we want to not meet next Tuesday so we can align our calendars, but then get on a weekly and then if we need a break because we have to schedule the attorney or the engineer or there's some, some reason to not meet a week, we would step away with averaging, you know, we're probably going to have four to six meetings between now and when we're prepared for our report. That's an estimate. You guys could rock it next meeting and we're done. Um, there's the potential. But I want to plan for at least getting four to six between now and um, that mid to late March. So question one, is Tuesday still viable? Question two, can we meet next Tuesday? Uh, not next Tuesday because that's city commission. Sorry, can we not meet next Tuesday, but begin our cadence of Tuesdays that aren't city commission meetings? Is, I need to go back on myself. In meetings that the city commission doesn't meet, are you once a month, Jim, or twice a month? We uh, are once a month. Awesome. So we get a break next week, and then we start a three-week cadence to meet, and then we'll have a break when there's a commission meeting. And then hopefully we're right around wrapping up so that next commission meeting, which would be uh, maybe a special meeting to receive our report, they're ready for us before that April commission meeting, if I had that correct in my head. Is there a second day that is close to where when there's a city commission meeting on Tuesday, we could meet a different day that week? Monday was the closest day that wasn't Tuesday. Day that wasn't Tuesday. When's the March commission meeting or the uh, city hall meeting? Uh, March 8th. March 8th, thanks. Uh, next Monday we have the SEM, I'm sorry, the MDOT um, Woodward information meeting. So we probably don't want to meet next Monday. So in short, you definitely get next week off. That means <laughs> I'm, I'm by day, you know, teach at a university. That means you have a whole week to do your homework more than you thought you did, including honestly and, and without humor, that tool that you have, really think and take notes on a, on a legal pad or on a Word doc about fairness and play with it so that we can really hit the ground running uh, a week from next Tuesday. Um, so our next meeting, unless there is objection, would be the 15th of February and then plan for the 22nd and March 1st as the cadence. Kate. Um, I just know that I'll be out of town on the 22nd. Um, I won't be in town. I will be, too. Me, too. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's the school winter break. Yeah. Oh, for that week. That, the whole not, week, yeah. Not just that 20 seconds. Yeah. Well, let's, meet, let's schedule for the 15th, and maybe by the end of that meeting, we can see how far progress is and skip the 22nd, and, and maybe we meet twice that, that um, following week. Um, if Monday's available on the 28th and the 1st. Should we hold March 1st then? Let's definitely hold March 1st. So we have scheduled now, and, and we'll update this in the drive with a schedule. Um, and I'll say it again for the public. The drive is also available to the public. If you go to the city's website, you can find access to, when I say the drive, it's a Google Drive that everyone can see the files. We're going to schedule for the 15th and the 1st in this room at 7 p.m. Awesome. Um, again, one more reminder, and, and I like to reiterate, and please be patient with me. Be prepared to discuss chair, vice chair, and secretary. Be prepared to talk about fairness philosophy as it relates to infrastructure. And be prepared to review, um, as a group, suggestions to look at model um, options on the big board. Any questions before we jump to the second public discussion opportunity? I've got one. Um, regarding fairness, <coughs> I suspect that's going to be a well, it has great potential to be a very long discussion, which is great. Um, I'm just curious, had either of you been kind of capturing some of the points on fairness? For example, Jim, you made a point about if you did the lineal feet thing, you know, how does it really look on a, a street with lots of homes versus a street with less homes? And that sort of, that's a concern to think about. Do you have a summary of all the kind of fairness concerns that we've already identified? 
and we can use that list to start with in our discussion. No, uh, because the fairness discussions that we've had really focused around flat fee versus millage. And I would rather you guys yeah. explore and define that space for what you think about that. Mm -hmm. I just tried to summarize the arguments that have already been put out there into the public realm. Um, so I, I would prefer for you to. How do you detailed are your notes from this meeting? Oh, Jay, the answer to <laughs> that question is yes. I have notes okay. that we can start with. And I think, and I'll, I'll think that through, but I think what we'll do on the big board is I'll start with, with taking notes while you're talking mm -hmm. and, and maybe have columns that I'm putting comments in. And so I will, I will attempt to organize that discussion. I've got, I'll start with a few notes from this meeting um, in, that, in that presentation, but I'll be active with that as you have your discussion. And then at least it's getting captured there for folks to, to contemplate. And then we can add that to the drive for a, a post-contemplation. Mm -hmm. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, great. So if, if the body's comfortable with it, I'll ask for a second uh, public discussion or public comment from those in the audience. I'm Ann Perry from, from 35 Devonshire. I just want to thank everybody for doing this. I know it's a lot of um, details. Your questions tonight have been really interesting, and I'm excited to see where all of this discussion goes. But thank you all for your time on this. Hi, I'm Doug McElroy from 27 Oakland Park. Um, my, I have a comment on the spreadsheet that we're using as kind of the basis for discussions. Uh, there was a passing comment earlier in the evening about looking at other sources of revenue to fund some of this, and there is nowhere on that spreadsheet to take uh, into consideration any other sources of, uh, of uh, funding from other parts of the city budget that we decide would be good to direct toward the infrastructure. So either we're going to, I guess, agree that that's not going to be part of the discussion, or I suggest maybe we uh, uh, look at updating that spreadsheet so it somehow can be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. I'd like to bring it back to the members if there's any um, closing comments or, or statements, questions that you'd like to make before I'd ask for uh, a time to adjourn. Yeah, Jim, I know in, in some of the earlier presentations that question was looked at. Is, you know, is there something that could be reduced you know, to offset some of this? It might be worth just kind of recapping that maybe at the beginning of the next meeting since that question has come up. Right. It, it, it becomes the question of reliability yeah. and predictability. Um, there are other sources. We have the infrastructure millage. Yeah. We could combine some street maintenance potentially with streets where this is happening and, and supplement, you know, $50,000 yeah. a year. The question is, you know, is that a 20-year? Right. Right. This is, this is taking the cost and, and breaking it out actually over 30 years. Mm -hmm. So is that something we can commit to over 30 years? Or is that the percentage? Does that get back to that percentage basis where, okay, well, this year we can, we can allocate $100,000 from the general fund. Yeah. So now we'll reduce all these other things by whatever corresponding yeah. percentage that is. That, I think that starts to get to those if-then statements right. that we, we've talked about. Um, because I, that is where the struggle is, you know, is, is there a 30-year, $150,000 subsidy we come up with from yeah. other parts of the city? And there's just a lot of unknowns. Yeah. Around no, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable having been involved in a number of discussions that, it, it, that there's not any undiscovered, you know, slush in the city budget. It, it, but I think it, it does come up every time we talk about this. So of course. it might be worth just to recap it, you know. Yeah. I guess just the question I had to kind of dovetail into this, um, there were a couple of things you mentioned in the presentation um, talking about last year's budget and how things were spent, and there were a couple small millages as I looked at the amounts that were going to be expiring in 
sometime before summer, if I recall correctly. Um, Not this summer. Soon. In coming years. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Right. All right. So that will, you know, have a, a benefit for our tax rate. But that, that comes over the course of, of a few years. Okay. All right. I was hoping that it was this summer. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. All right, that is the requisite amount of silence that I need. Um, the time is 8.50 without a chair. I will ask for just consent that the meeting is uh, over at 8.50 this evening. Thank you so much for those that are watching on TV, those that attended, and, of course, our members. And thank you, Jim. Thank you. 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 Well, whoa. <laughs>